This lesson is going to connect meiosis to Mendelian genetics. So if you haven't already established an understanding of the phases of meiosis, um, I want you to go back and um, watch the Khan Academy video on meiosis. I think he does a very nice job of explaining the phases of meiosis and, and things like crossing over and how you end up with um, the end result of meiosis. Um, so assuming you've, you've already got meiosis down, let's just do a quick review and then we'll connect the two. So in meiosis, remember we are starting with a cell that is 2N. So let's look at, we're going to draw a cell with a chromosome that we're going to label 1. And that's the chromosome that, say, comes from one of your parents, your mom. And then 1 prime. And that's the chromosome that came from the other parent. And on both these chromosomes, let's put on the end of it here, we have the allele for the gene for being able to roll your tongue, which would be the big R, and not being able to roll your tongue would be the, the little r. Okay, so we see that this individual, on their one, they have, they have the full set of chromosomes for the one. They have one from each parent, and they're heterozygous. They have one from each. Now let's look at another, another chromosome. Let's look at chromosome two. And we'll give it that. And then the homologous pair we'll call 2 prime. Again, we can say from mom and from dad. And on this one, let's say you have the gene, the allele, excuse me, for hitchhiker's thumb versus a straight thumb when you stick your thumb up. And so, and if now, in a human, there are 23 pairs of these, so this would continue on, and then it would end with, in, with two X's, or an X and a Y. Um, we're going to just stop right there, so I don't have to draw so many, and just go with two chromosomes. So this is what we're starting with. And remember that in meiosis, first thing that happens is we, as we go through the phases of meiosis, so we go through... Um, prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase 1, and then prophase, metaphase, anaphase, and telophase 2. And initially, in prophase, we double the chromosomes. And so now let's redraw this. So we have our 1, and we now have 2 of them, and they're joined together. And on the end of this, we have that. And then we have our one prime, and they've doubled, and we have two of them. And on the end of that, we have the recessive. And then we double our two, and our Two prime, and on the end of that we have our dominant for hitchhiker's thumb and our recessive for hitchhiker's thumb. So in prof in 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 meiosis, we go from a normal cell to this cell in prophase, which is still two n, because even though it's a double set of chromosomes, it's still the full complement of genetic information. Um, we still have the 1 and the 1 prime. I see I have a mistake here. This is 1 prime. And and the full complement of the, the 2 chromosome. Now, recall in meiosis then we end up with dividing this cell in half and then dividing it in half again. And the chromosomes line up um, during metaphase and and then they split, and anaphase and telophase, and they do that twice. And so let's, let's look at how they might line up. And so let's, um, let's start with our, our, our two number ones. And
and our two number one primes and we'll line them up this way and then we'll take our number twos and we'll line them up this way and our two primes and we'll line them up this way all right so you can see that if this is how the cell lines up during metaphase when it divides these the end result is we're going to end up as it divides this way and then eventually divides again we're going to end up with in these gametes over here we're going to end up with ones and twos all ones and twos so we're going to end up with a um, and I'm skipping many of the steps of meiosis, so that's why if you don't understand meiosis, you might want to go back. So I'm going to end up with a cell with a 1 and a 1, and then um, get the right color here, a 2 and a 2. All right, and, that, and then on this side, I'm going to end up with 1 primes and 2 primes in the gametes over on this side. And the reason that that all happened is because of how they lined up here and but we can change this scenario so let's change this and we could say that instead the two prime, the yellow two prime, end up on the left side, and the purple twos end up on the right side, which means in the end, we would not have this here, but instead, we'd have the yellow two prime. The yellow two prime on this side. And so this is, this is called um, segregation these get separated from each other during meiosis and um, there's it can get set up so that on this side of the cell before it divides you had all the one the two the three the four the five the six or you could have a one and then a two prime and then a three and then a four prime and there's a 50 50 chance that the chromosomes when they line up in metaphase are going to be set up this way and this way or it's going to be reversed the other way and this way and this way or it could be reversed this way and this way so there's a 50 percent chance for each gamete that it's going to get the one or the one prime and the two or the two prime now if you have on those capital R, little r, now we see that we have a 50-50 chance of getting one allele over the other allele. And that happens, it's a 50-50 chance for each chromosome to give the one from the father or the one from the mother. And so that segregation happens for each one. So there are about 8 million combinations of how these can be lined up in the cell. Um, so with being the one prime on one side and the one on the other side, or it could be the one and the one prime, and then for the next chromosome it could be the two and the two prime, or it could be the two prime or the two on the left or the right. So with 23 pairs and a 50-50, there's about 8 million possible combinations there. So already a lot of genetic variation can happen because of this prophase, metaphase, anaphase, telophase 1, and then going into, te um, into 2. And you'll s and you notice that, now let's connect this. So if we have our Punnett squares, and talking about Mendel, and we have, let's say we have this parent right here, and that parent can give you the capital R, or they have a 50-50 chance of giving you the little r because of how these divide in meiosis.
And then the other parent, let's say that parent is crossing with another parent who is genetically just like them in their heterozygous. And so they would have a 50-50 chance of giving the one chromosome or the one primate chromosome with the little r versus the big r on it. And so if we, and then we, and because it's a 50-50 chance for each one, then we're creating the Punnett square where you're getting either this one or this one. So a 50-50 chance, one or the other. And by doing that cross, then we can see that because we have a 50-50 chance of getting this one or this one, and a 50-50 chance of getting this one or this one, then we have a 25% chance of that combination, a 25% chance of that combination, and a 25% chance of that combination, and then a 25% chance of that combination. So this 50-50 chance is what Mendel discovered, and it led to this idea that these somehow, and he didn't know the mechanism at the time, that the allele for, say, rolling your tongue versus not rolling your tongue had a 50-50 chance of getting passed on to the offspring. And the way that works is through the process of meiosis, your parents have a 50-50 chance of giving you either one of the number ones or one of the number one primes. Now, let's go back in our scenario. If you assume that our parents actually had that, they had two big R's, then it doesn't matter. There's a 50-50 chance. It's still a 50-50 chance, but the 50-50 chance is between giving you two of the same thing. And so if you're homozygous, you're going to pat you have a 100% chance of passing on that because you're carrying two of the same thing. Now we said we had 8 million combinations. What we haven't taken into account here is the process of crossing over. And if you remember from your um, meiosis that when they are lined up in prophase like this, so these are next to each other, then we actually get a mixture. So we might get a piece of this blue one switches over to there, and a piece of the red one switches over to there. Well, if that's the case, then that would change this and this. So now we've changed our genetic code on the one and the one prime in this case by taking the alleles and swapping them. So now if you imagine that going through your second set of meiosis, in the end you might get this red one, but on the end of it, instead of being the big R like we're seeing up here, instead you have a chunk of the blue on the end of it which carries with it the little r. And what this means is instead of 8 million combinations, this crossing over happens randomly. It can happen at the ends. It can happen in the middle of the chromosome. It can happen, or it can not happen at all, or it can be big chunks or little chunks, and it's random. So there is essentially an unlimited number of combinations that can occur because we already started with 8 million possible combinations due to the segregation and then you add in the crossing over and which can happen anywhere or not at all or all over the place where you've basically made unlimited combinations and that's why um, even though there's 7 billion people on the planet genetically we were all unique because of crossing over and this segregation of these chromosomes during meiosis. Now we also have another concept here called independent assortment. And what that says is whatever happens with the one chromosome that has the big R's on it has no impact on what happens to the two chromosomes. So whether they are arranged with the one prime on the left or the one on the left, that doesn't have any impact on what happens down here with the next set of chromosomes, whether they are arranged with the two on the left and the two prime on the right, or vice versa. So they are completely separate from each other. So let's think about how that translates then to when we talk about Mendel's things. So then in Mendel, that's where we get into the double Punnett square, the dihybrid cross. And in the dihybrid cross, 
we are demonstrating mathematically this independent assortment. And so if we had a parent, so let's take this parent here that is, I'm going to go back to my original here, that had one of each for rolling the tongue and then also one of each for being a hitchhiker thumb or not a hitchhiker thumb. And so that's our original parent. And let's assume that parent has children with someone who has the same same traits and the same mixture of dominant and recessive. Because each one is independent of the other. So the what happens with the R's, because they're on the one chromosome, are independent of what happens with the H's because they're on the two chromosome. And that's why we use this process here to find all the possible combinations. It's not just eight combinations, you know, doubling it from four to eight. It's 16 because the R's and the H's are separate from each other because they're on different chromosomes. And so, if, remember, we, we, we take our first and then we take our outsides, and then we take the insides, and then we take the last ones, and then you would do the same for this one. So you take the first, and then you take the outsides, and then the insides, and then the last ones. And if you fill all this in, we find that we have nine individuals that have rolling tongue and um, hitchhiker thumb. We have three that have one dominant and one recessive. And then we have three that have the other dominant and the other recessive. And then we have one that is all recessives. And we get this 9 to 3 to 3 1 ratio. But what I want to demonstrate here, this isn't really a lesson about how to do these Punnett squares, but to show that this variation that occurs happens because of how the chromosomes originally line up up here. And then by adding crossing over, we add in a bunch more combinations of possibilities. But whenever meiosis happens, you get a 50-50 chance of getting one chromosome over the other chromosome. And each chromosome then is separate from each other. So we have segregation, saying that we get a 50-50 chance of getting one or the other. And then we have the law of independent assortment, saying that what happens with the one chromosome has no bearing on what happens with the two chromosome. So if you're inheriting traits that are separate from each other, in that they are on different chromosomes, they, you inherit those independently of each other. Now let's imagine that we have a trait um, with, along with rolling your tongue, you have another trait that is right below it. Then those two traits tend to be linked together. And so you can think of some things that tend to be linked together. So like um, red hair and freckles tend to be linked together. So if you see traits that always come together or almost always come together, that tells you they must be on the same chromosome right next to each other like two traits that would be right here. So if you crossed over one, you'd cross over the other as well. You can have traits that are further apart in the chromosome, and then you wouldn't inherit those together as much. But the main point here is to see that how the chromosomes line up and then separate during meiosis leads to the mathematical calculations we do with Punnett squares and Mendelian genetics that each trait comes on a chromosome an allele, and you get a 50-50 chance of getting the chromosome that you got from your mother or that you got from your father, and then passing that on. And if you then have multiple traits on different chromosomes, then you have many more combinations because you have to account for every possible combination because they are independent of each other. What happens on chromosome 1 is independent of what happens on chromosome 2.